On this episode of the Ask Mike Reynolds Show, we talk about some of our strategies for managing a flat thoracic spine. The Ask Mike Reynolds Show. Helping people feel better, move better, and perform better. Before we get to the podcast, I wanted to make sure you knew about my free online course on the introduction to performance therapy and training. If you want to learn how to get started optimizing and enhancing performance, this is the course for you. Head to MikeReynolds.com slash performance to sign up today. Welcome back, everybody, to the latest episode of the Ask Mike Reynolds Show. We're here up in Boston, champion PT and performance. I'm here with Dave Tilly, Dewesh Podell, Lenny McCrina, Lisa Lowe, uh, Dan Pope, Mike Scaduto, and Kevin Coughlin here answering your questions. Anything you want to talk about, head to the website, MikeRound.com, click on that podcast link, and you can fill out the form to keep asking us more questions. Len, who do we have for students today? We have some amazing students. <clears throat> we'll work left to right on the screen. <clears throat> we have Aaliyah Penner from Duke University. We have Sean Bean from UNLV. We have Dan Chappelle from URI and his tie to Sunday Red today. We have Grace Suggs from Duke University and Dean Bonneau we have from George Washington University, the first president of the United States of America. So many, so many. Is that, is that an actual truth? I don't even know it's true anymore. Is that if George true? Washington was, I think so. I don't know though. I, I mean, at this point, I don't, I don't I, believe anything. Exactly. <laughs> you know, so. All right, who's up for a question today? Who wants to jump in? from australia says hi guys big fan of the podcast from australia and he wants to know when managing overhead athletes who have a flat thoracic spine how do you go about assessing whether they potentially would benefit from more thoracic lordosis or thoracic kyphosis in order to improve overhead movement patterns i appreciate that both have a role in shoulder function and i'm curious if you think that i should be prioritizing one with this population Awesome. Good job, Leah. Okay. So managing flat thoracic spine and specifically, I like how Mitch tied this in a little bit where what we're trying to accomplish here is overhead movement patterns, right? Um, and somebody that has a flat thoracic spine and, and, you know, Mitch specifically said she'll be working on lordosis or kyphosis. That'd be very interesting. Um, I don't know who, who, who wants to start maybe kind of talking about flat thoracic spine. I think that's something we kind of all probably see to an extent in our athletes, but Mike, why don't you, why don't you start talking about, uh, just the concept of that in general and your thoughts? Yeah, certainly. I think, uh, it all starts with your assessment process. Um, so for our upper extremity um, assessment or evaluation, we're always assessing the scapular, scapular thoracic position and the position of the thoracic spine plus the rib cage, right? So we'll start just looking at someone from behind. Um, I'm looking at where their shoulder blades are, are kind of sitting on the rib cage and how their thoracic spine is situated. I think some people um, get in trouble when they are trying to assess the curvature of the thoracic spine. If you only look from the lateral view, um, you may get fooled sometimes based on how their uh, scapula is sitting. If they're anteriorly tipped through their scapula, it may look like they have a really big thoracic kyphosis. Once you get in and, and palpate the thoracic spine, you can actually feel that it's pretty flat. Um, and we see that quite a bit in, in baseball players. Um, and that can have an influence as to how their scapula moves. Um, I tend to see, uh, I think we all tend to see that baseball players in particular tend to be depressed on their right side. So they have a horizontal clavicle. If you look from the front, um, the scapula itself sits a little bit more depressed. They have this, uh, typically have a flat thoracic, um, spine. And when they go to overly, uh, sorry, when they go to elevate their, their arm, they tend to get a lot of spinning of the scapula. They get a lot of upward rotation, but they don't get a great amount of protraction. Um, so that may be somebody, if we see all those things together, that we do work on a little bit of thoracic flexion um, to improve the congruency of the scapula on the rib cage, help optimize how the muscles interact for that force couple of upward rotation and protraction. I, I like that. That's a good point too, because if, if it's not really about what the thoracic spine looks like, it's how the scapula interacts with the thoracic spine. So uh, that's obviously the most important part. So that's a really good point that you added there, Mike. It's, it's about also assessing how the scapula moves on that flat thoracic spine. Cause I mean, what if the scapula moves completely normal? What if it's completely right. fine? There's no big deal. Then it doesn't matter. Right. You know, especially if your goal is overhead reach. 
right? So yeah. uh, who else? I mean, I, I think we all deal with this and and this is something I think has had a little bit more exposure maybe on social media the last several years is the concept of flat thoracic spine. Anybody else have just any thoughts in general on this? Who wants to jump in? Dan? I feel like I talk too much. Um, <clears throat> no, but it's always great insight. <laughs> Thanks. Um, I don't know. It, in my world, you want a lot of thoracic extension and some of the best Olympic weightlifting athletes I've seen, they have great thoracic extension, right? It's phenomenal. They need to stay super upright when they catch a snatch or clean. It's also super helpful from a, a jerk perspective. It's almost always we're working on trying to gain a little bit more extension in these folks. Um, so at least in my population, I'm almost never working on a lot of thoracic flexion. Um, just from a performance perspective, maybe from a health perspective, make an argument, but, um, to try to gain more thoracic extension is almost always what we're looking for. And I think you're also looking for kind of extremes. It's, you know, what's best, uh, mobility for Olympic weightlifter is probably not normal mobility. You probably need to have some excessive range of motion, in a lot of places. And I think the thoracic spine is one of those. So, yeah. And if you look at most athletes that need to get, uh, into some sort of overhead position. So let's say, like you said, a snatch, right. Or a baseball player when they're in, in max layback of their shoulder, right. That's not just shoulder motion. That's thoracic extension. That probably plays actually a significant, uh, amount of the percentage of their range of motion comes from thoracic extension. So, you know, sometimes thoracic extension in and of itself isn't necessarily a bad thing, right? You know, sometimes I wonder with thoracic extension, if we're over diagnosing it sometimes, right? And, and maybe it's just, it's, it's not necessarily, you know, the concept of, of where they're sitting in their posture, because there's lots of things that can change that even like lumbopelvic dynamics can change the way your, you know, your lordosis and your lumbar spine, which would change your kyphosis and your thoracic spine. There's so many things that put put the, the thoracic spine in a different position. It, it, does flat thoracic spine matter if your thoracic spine could move into flexion and extension well? Anybody? That's what I was going to say. That's what I was going to say, well, yeah, say is I, I think we're talking we're talking about a couple of different things here, and which I think we're lumping it into the same thing. Maybe at least that's my perspective, especially in the question, because if we're talking about an overhead athlete, their overhead is here. Right? They're at ninety degrees their hands overhead but they're at 90 degrees so their amount of extension that they need they need it to throw but they're never getting up here where the scapula and the thoracic spine actually have to physically extend it's when they are throwing they get the thoracic extension but i think they're also very mobile and so if they are kyphotic which a lot of our baseball players are like mike said they have underlying mobility especially the college and professional they're pitching at that level because they're so mobile and not just mobile in their shoulder, they're mobile probably globally. And so their, their ability to get out of that kyphotic position and get some extension to afford them to throw 95 plus, I think is there because they're so young and mobile. It's when they start getting 40, 45 and you start losing some of that mobility, but you're still trying to be active. I think that's when we start seeing issues with, yeah, they need more extension or they're trying to do overhead stuff like in dance population or even in Dave's population, that they are, that's when you start seeing the issue is probably a little bit more pronounced, at least in my opinion. Yeah, I like that. What do you think, Dwash? <laughs> yeah, no, I was just going to kind of build on the, the point that you started with, Mike, of I think that resting posture of that flat T-spine probably doesn't matter that much. Now, do you need to be able to get into flexion in an active position? Probably, right? Even in a baseball player, they obviously get into that laid back position with a ton of T-spine extension, even a lot of lumbar extension. But when you're coming down on your delivery and on your follow through, you need to be able to flex the trunk and come all the way through, right? So that ability to flex is very important. Do you add a standing posture need to have kyphosis in your T-spine for an athlete? Maybe not. You know, so that's kind of what I, what I go to. So but like when we're doing some of our like med ball throws and stuff, like, yeah, like we put positions, we put people in positions sometimes where we're going to exaggerate a little bit more of that trunk flexion, and maybe get a little bit more of that, thora that thoracic flexion. Right. And maybe we'll do some other exercises that are going to pr uh, promote a little bit more of that reach and a little bit more of that round. Maybe it's some of our breathing drills early on in our training sessions, or maybe some of our crawl patterns. Where we're really, you know, asking people to, to get a little bit of better of a reach so they're not, you know, weighing out with the scaps and stuff like that. So I think the ability to flex is important. The ability to protract, like Mike said, is important. So I think if we just kind of take care of that. The, the standing posture from what we see, probably not the end of the world. 
Yeah, it makes sense. And I feel like we say that a lot about posture now is that, you know, static posture in and of itself is just a very piece of the puzzle, probably a small piece of the puzzle or the starting point of the puzzle. Um, but, you know, we don't make a lot of clinical decisions just based on just resting static posture. It's about how they move. So like Mike said, it's about how their scapulars move on their thorax. And like Dwesh said, it's about can they get in and out of the right movements um, with their thorax that that they need in their sport. Um, Lisa, what about you? I mean, you know, as, as our rowing specialist, Obviously, thoracic extension seems, you know, like we're talking about overhead, but, you know, rowing is more horizontal and got to be a ton of flat thoracic spine issues in your world, right? What do you think? It kind of can go both ways, sort of. Like people can end up with really flat thoracic spines if they use like a ton of scap protraction to get into the like catch position. Um but a lot of rowers rest with more excessive kyphosis just because of continuously trying to like sit and reach forward. Um, and, but it all still goes back to the same that we've been talking about is that I really more so care if they actually can move their spine into other positions. And that's, that's where usually it's really, really hard for them to reverse their thoracic spine into extension. Um, if, if there's somebody who has trouble with like thoracic spine mobility um, and usually just gaining like even a teensy bit of that, like their, their ability to get their scapula in the proper positioning and be more connected through their shoulders into their hips, like kind of comes a little bit with just gaining some of that thoracic spine mobility. Um, so it, you know, it all is similar of, of what we're saying, but just a different sort of like resting posture typically. Um, I don't, I mean, some people like Mike was saying, you'll, you'll see that their thoracic spine truly is a little bit flatter. Um, and it's more of the kyphotic kind of illusion is from their scapula. Um, but a lot of people, it is actually like a pretty decent thoracic spine curve. Um, so, so would you do anything different? So if somebody came to you and obviously they're a rower and, and trust me, I think this conversation applies to everybody, not just rowing, because I think a horizontal push and pull is a very fundamental movement pattern that all humans do just during daily activities. But, uh, it, you know, if somebody came to you as like a rower, do you look at their thoracic flexion and extension and then say, heck, like you don't, you don't have that much thoracic flinch flexion. So you're going to have to protract your scaps more. Does that impact how you, how you work with your athletes? Lisa? Oh, hundred percent. Yeah, 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 absolutely. I mean, and especially with, um, like rib stress injuries and all that kind of stuff in rowing, if their thoracic spine and the ribs don't move well, then they're just like opening the door for more overload in that area. Um, so, and, and especially since, you know, rowing is unique in terms of like, you are loading like a really strong horizontal push pull kind of combo upper and lower body, um, with like, very, very high levels of breathing, you know, kind of at the <laughs> same time, because it like races, you're breathing really, really hard while you're pushing and pulling really, really hard. Um, you know, having that thoracic spine mobility to support like good breaths and, um, and, you know, to be able to maintain a good core position and all that kind of stuff is it's super important. So it's definitely something I zero in on quite a bit when I have a new rower come in and, and that I check in, on a lot with the rowers that I work with over time. Um, because if they start to lose that mobility, if they're someone who has it, then it's also kind of usually a sign to me that they're like a little bit on the overtrained side and that they need to spend a little bit more time kind of rebalancing that too. Um, that's great. So no, that's it's, great. It's, it's pretty important. Yeah, that's that's almost like how we look at the arms and our our athletes with their with the throwers, right? You're looking at thoracic mobility almost in your athletes to see their their overload status. So, so Mitch, I think like in summary, I think I, I think our, the main point to get across here is that flat thoracic spine in and of itself may not matter, right? But it's more about the it's not the starting point, but it's their ability to move throughout space. And you know, don't forget that that interacts with lumbopelvic and then that interacts with scapulothoracic. You have to put that all together. So hopefully that helped. 
hopefully I think like next time you see somebody with a flat thoracic spine, you don't just jump straight into like a protocol for the person with a flat thoracic spine and maybe you kind of dig it out a little bit deeper to, to see if that is the interventions that they need. So anyway, great question. If you have something like that, head to microronald.com, click on that podcast link and you can fill out the form. In the meantime, please subscribe, Apple Podcasts, Spotify, rate and review us. We really appreciate it. We'll keep doing these episodes. Thank you so much. See you on the next one.